Good evening, folks. Appreciate you guys tuning in to another Onyx Masterclass here with uh, Matt Ross from the National Deer Association and another installment of our Deer Steward Live uh, class with those guys over at NDA. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, the Deer Steward course is something that NDA, how long, is, how long has that course been available, Matt? Since 2007 was the first okay. year we, we released it, yeah. So working towards two decades, uh, and I mean, the amount of knowledge that is in that course, uh, I cannot overstate the amount of knowledge in that course. Um, and if you guys kind of want a more holistic sampling of it, you can go to the Onyx Hunt YouTube channel. Um, and we have posted the prior Deer Steward live um master classes that we've done with dr craig harper we did one with kip adams we did one with bronson strickland um and so those are all the same format as we have here tonight where they are going through their presentations for their modules within deer steward so it gives you the ability to really get very warranted paywalled information for free as a sample of what the whole course holds um, and again, like these guys are just scratching the surface, showing you, uh, you know, what is available in this course. So definitely encourage you guys to go check that out and and learn more. Um, and so, Matt, I will uh, let you introduce yourself and kind of your topic here for tonight. And we'll continue to let folks roll in here for a couple minutes. So let us know what you're seeing on trail cameras after your introduction. Sounds good. So uh, evening, everybody, or afternoon for, for those on the west coast uh, my name is matt ross i'm the director of conservation for nda for the national deer association and uh you're, i'm talking to you today from uh the northeast i live in in uh, new york state and uh excited to talk the topic i'm covering that's part of the deer steward series as jared said is on deer movements and i've actually kind of made a frankenstein of a type of talk where i pulled in some slides from a couple of the presentations mostly our deer movements and home range uh, session or module, and a little bit from uh, our one on hunting pressure, which I know everybody's concerned with, right? Where do deer go when we pressure them? And so uh, it's a little bit of both, so you get a, a nice taste of, of, of each. Um, our season, well, I, in New York, we have two zones, northern zone and southern zone. Um, our season is about to kick off in most of the state on October 1st. I have not been hunting yet. Uh, it actually opened in the northern zone, which is in Adirondacks a couple of days ago. But uh, getting some good deer on camera. Um, we have a lot of deer uh, where I live. I'm in the Hudson River Valley. But look, about Everybody here is New York. They think of New York City. I'm about three hours from New York City. But uh, we got a lot of deer. We need to shoot a lot of does. Uh, it's a lot of dairy farms and beef farms um, in this area, in this tight little valley valley between the Adirondacks and the, the um, Green Mountain National Forest, but uh, got some well, good bucks running around. So sounds I'm, like I'm excited. Does got to go uh, stick your kids in some food plot tree stands and they'll keep you busy uh, in the garage cutting meat for the rest of the fall, huh? It's a, it's a family affair for sure. The, the, the deer or venison processing after a deer goes down, we all get involved. It's awesome. Heck yeah. Um, well, sweet. We got a couple hundred folks in here. And so just a couple housekeeping things. Uh, you know, you guys are already using the chat saying, hey, I'm Matt from Illinois or Heather from Michigan. That's perfect. The chat is a great place to shoot the breeze, you know, tell folks what you're seeing on trail camera, uh, you know, go back and forth about some of this data that Matt is going to present to us. And then if you have questions that you would like Matt to address towards the end of this masterclass, please put them in the Q&A and not the chat. It helps me immensely just being able to grab the questions versus, you know, sort through the chat and grab questions in there. Um, obviously there's a bunch of people in here, so please just keep it cordial, keep it friendly, uh, and, and remain, uh, a good, good folks to one another. Um, and then the last thing is, is we will be doing a giveaway. Uh, NDA is always so kind to give away a free seat to the entire Deer Steward One course. So we'll be giving that away as well as some Onyx merch. So we'll post that giveaway link here. Oh, about 40 minutes into the webinar. That way you guys can fill that out. Only those that are inside of the live webinar will be able to be entered. Uh, and without further ado, Matt, kick it off. Tell us about deer movements, man. Sounds good. Let me share my screen. And 
Let me know if it looks good on your end. Perfect. We got you. All right. Sounds good. So this talk is under your movement, as I mentioned. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple of things at the, at the forefront. One, uh, I'm going to try to keep it concise. So I'm going to fly through. There's a lot of slides in here. Um, there might be some stats on there that I don't hit, but we all know this is being recorded. You can go back and watch it, which is awesome. Um, second thing is we have technology today that is unsurpassed. It's amazing technology. Just think about what is in your phone today compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And the research I'm presenting today is all GPS or geo uh, geographic positioning systems. Everybody knows what GPS stands for geographic position system collars like the one on this buck on this screen not in not telemetry stuff i have a couple of older data points in there and I'll, I'll mention but pretty much everything in here is gps research which means we know where that deer that has the collar on it is standing within a couple meters and that's how accurate this information is which is amazing i mean just thinking about um some collars even have cameras in them so you can see what the deer is saying um, the technology and collars today are just awesome. And I'm going to cover bucks, does, fawns, all kinds of parts of the population. It's not just a buck talk, but the big buck on the screen, and I know why most of you are spending an afternoon listening to me jabber on about deer movement. We're, we care about bucks, right? We care about them because we want to know where they go when we go in the woods um, and why we don't see more of them. So uh, this is one of the more popular topics that we cover in our Deer Steward course. Um, as Jared said, uh, Deer Steward is a comprehensive training. We have online and in-person options. Uh, everybody starts in an online course, and we have all the folks that he mentioned that speak, along with other NDA staff and other researchers. There's actually five or six uh, university professors that are actually doing this deer research, and uh, we have them in, in there. And if that's the the uh, web address there on the screen. I'll bring it up at the very end. Um, but it's a great start to learn. And really the course is designed to take anybody, whether you've been hunting for 20 years or you're brand new, to be able to understeer, understand deer biology, uh, deer ecology, their use of habitat, their movements, of course, diseases, um, how to manage land going into food plot management, all of it. And so check that out. So that's my plug for Deer Steward. Um, I'm going to cover a wide range of studies here, over a dozen, as I said in the description. Um, it's probably way over a dozen. It was just kind of a thing we threw out there. But the research comes from all the universities on the left, from north to south, and uh, money that was funded for a lot of this research from state agencies and private um, companies like DuPont. And so we're going to cover all the bases. I'm in New York. I saw I saw some folks uh, say they're from New York as well, but as as west as California and as far east as as Maine. And so we're going to cover all the bases geographically in this presentation. And what I'm going to cover through the talk to just break it down is we're going to talk about dispersal, what that is, home range, which I'm sure most of you have heard the term home range, and core area, and and how deer use those. Uh, seasonal shifts in those things, like how over the, the year those things change, what they do on a daily basis in terms of movement, how much are they on their feet, how much are they not. We're going to talk about something called excursions, and I'll define that. And then all of these influences on the above five bullet points that goes with age as a deer gets older or when they're younger, how does that influence their when they disperse or when they go on an, excursion, on an excursion or food avail availability or weather or moon. And of course, we're going to end with hunter pressure. So stay with me to the end because uh, obviously that's the one we care about the most, but we're going to go through all these things. And we'll, we'll begin with dispersal. And what dispersal is, is when a deer leaves the area in which it was born and goes somewhere else to set up shop, set up home. Um, this is, of course, done at an early age, and it's mostly bucks. There are some does that go on dispersals, but it's mostly bucks that do it. And between half and three quarters of all bucks leave where they were born. It's nature's way of ensuring genetic flow. And so on average, it's about 70% of all bucks. 
So we're seeing deer like in that photo on the right do it and not deer of an older age class. This is done between 12 and 18 months of age because they're going to be away from uh, like uh, genetically related individuals. So when they breed another individual in the, in the future, they're not passing on their genes to somebody that's related to them. And so this is just natural. And uh, a lot of people get kind of bent out of shape about dispersal because they're thinking I'm gonna lose my bucks or going somewhere else. Well, guess what? Somebody's other's bucks are coming to you. So it's just, it's an even swap. Um, they go five to seven miles away. The longest known one that it was ever documented was over 130 miles in South Dakota, but they're not very far, five to five, six, seven miles away. And we found that they go further away with less cover, less forest cover. And so open environments, big open grasslands, or agriculturally rich states, they're gonna go further than states that have a lot of forest cover. We also have found that management may have a little bit of an influence, but not enough to the scale that we can see. And so there's a couple of properties compared here. Um, one being uh, King Ranch, one of their pastures. King Ranch is a well-known place in Texas, but one of their pastures that was not managed for deer, had a lot of cows on it. They found that any deer that was collared originally from there as a yearling dispersed further distances than a nearby ranch called Callahan that had a lot of good habitat management going on in that pasture where they were collaring the deer, meaning they didn't go quite as far from where the good habitat is. But still, look at those distances. It's still three, six, you know, seven miles away, meaning not I'm going to guess there's hardly anybody if no one on here owns properties that extend that size. So um, which means we, we have to think larger scale. Most of this is occurring in the fall. About three quarters of all dispersal is happening when their bucks are 18 months of age. About a quarter is when they're a year uh, old in the spring. That's primarily related to uh, their mom or their maternal aggression during fawning season when she's about to have a fawn. Um, that young buck gets kind of kicked out of the nest. But the ma majority is this time of year, to be honest with you, um, right before the fall, which is why those young bucks look like they're walking around like they're clueless is because some of them, well, they are clueless, but they're also probably on ground they've never been on before, or they've only been on a few weeks. Um, you can see in the graph in the top right corner, even, even that pre-management and post-management, there's not that much of an impact. And so the key points with dispersal to bring this all home, um, most bucks do it. Half to three quarters of bucks will disperse. Most of it's happening in the fall when we're hunting, um, meaning uh, we have to be aware of this occurring. We also have to be aware of the size of these dispersals and a landscape level approach, meaning working with your neighbors is the best way to minimize impacts of this natural thing that happens in the deer world. They're going to go away. You're going to get bucks from other places. But if you're all working in, say, a deer cooperative in a neighborhood, the habitat everywhere will be improved. Dis dispersal distances won't be quite as far. They're still going to go far away that they're not breeding with their related individuals. But you can keep a lot of bucks in the neighborhood, if you will, by, by doing that. All right, let's move to the second bullet point that I mentioned, home range and core area. And so the photo on the left there is showing every hour a point where that deer, this is a, a, a three and a half year old buck in these pictures, was standing to the within three meters. And so if you draw a line around 95% of those dots within, say, if that was a month or a year, you would get what's known as the home range. Um, not every point, but it's it's usually a high confidence in, interval of about 90 to 95%. That's that yellow line. If I were to say, where was, if I threw a dart at the at the photo on the left-hand side and I had a 50-50 chance of hitting that buck, maybe I'd, maybe I'd throw an arrow instead of a dart. Where, where was he standing? That is known as their core area, basically where they are half the time. And it may not sound, it's counterintuitive, I guess, but if you're looking at a place and say, where are they half the time? Well, that's like their bedroom. That's where they're spending. I mean, we're supposed to sleep eight hours a night, right? Um, we're, their, their core area is where they are half the time. And these things will change over. So we're gonna use those definitions throughout the rest of the presentation. 
what we do know is that for mature deer, anything that's older than a yearling or one and a half year old, so two and older, home range varies quite widely across the country. Um, so everybody probably has heard the old, the old uh, saying, you know, a deer's home range is about a square mile. That's true. Um, that's not made up, but it, it varies based on the landscape. And you can see it's in these studies, these four studies, they range from 250 acres um, or actually all the way down to 173 acres at the low end of the range in Louisiana, all the way up to 7,000 acres in a part of South Texas. Um, but, you know, these are these are all over the place. They widely range. But every study that I've ever looked at, core area, which is where a deer is 50% of the time, is always between 10 and 15% of the size of its actual home range. And so when you're talking about managing properties or, or managing deer, yeah, we do have to manage populations. That's what state agencies do. You can do that in a cooperative setting, but as an individual that hunts one property or as a person that hunts a property and you're talking to your neighbor, you know, these sizes of core areas are not that big. You can have an impact positive impact by by working through management. And so the core area of a deer is going to be anywhere between in the summer, much smaller, which you'll learn to a couple hundred acres in size, potentially in the fall. Um, but it's usually 10 to 15% of where their home range is. So let's talk about the influences on home range and core area, including a deer's personality, its age, the season of the year, how much cover there is, the food that they can access, cover is good, food is, is good too, and a physical barrier. So I'm gonna go through each one of those six bullet points and how they influence home range and core area, the size, the shape um, of those two things. And so this photo shows, dare I say, a deer's personality starting at a very young age. So personality is obviously a strong term because we're talking about deer, not humans, right? And uh, it's hard to like talk about deer having personalities, but um, you all have a personality. You know, some of you are probably homebodies. Some of you are wanderers. Jared and I were talking offline a little earlier. Uh, I'm a little, I'm more of a homebody. He just got back from Alaska. So he might be more of a wanderer. I do have to travel for work, which I do quite a bit, but I like being home. And you can see this in deer and you guys probably know this, you know, from trail cameras and observations, some deer all over the place, you see them all the time and some aren't. And so these are actually home ranges and core areas of uh, does in the white line, or the sorry, the, the black line, which is the white blob, um, and the, the dark circle that's kind of in the middle is the core area of, of that doe. And the small gray areas, or the gray areas that have little black dots in it, is its fawn's home range. And so on the left-hand side, what we see is home ranges of a couple does where their fawn likes to stay real close, right? And on the right-hand side of the screen is a couple does where uh, the doe has a home range and a small core area, but that fawn is going all over the place. They're wanderers. And so we call these either mobile or sedentary personalities, much like Norm on the left, he's kind of sedentary or the mover and shaker of you know Ted Danson on the right. So deer do have this personality trait and you'll see this through some of the graphs that I'm going to talk about. We do know, know how, no matter how much of a personality they have, it is to wander or not. As a deer gets older, particularly this is bucks in this slide, um, their home range will shrink. There was the old kind of wives tale that, you know, as the buck got older, white tail bucks we're talking about in this presentation, they would just be king of the kingdom, right? And they would go everywhere and kick every other buck's butt and gather up all the does that they can. Well, that's actually not true. As bucks age, their home range tends to shrink in all landscapes. And so you can see here, these circles represent home range and core area of deer in Texas, but it's going to hold true in other landscapes as well. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. As they survive, they are probably beating death over and over and over again. And they are experiencing risk in uh, you know, where their home range is. And so they can start to cherry pick the places where risk is the lowest, where they're running into danger the least. And so why wouldn't, as a buck gets older, spend less time? And so as you track deer over time, 
um, with cameras or observations and you pick out a buck that you might say, I want to kill at some point this year or next year, and you try to target that deer, the likelihood of that deer's home range getting smaller increases over time. How about season? So now we're looking at a home range in a core area of a uh, two and a half year old buck in Maryland. And the home range there is yellow. Um, it was 353 acres. This is on the Eastern shore of Maryland, spending a lot of time on the edge of that forest, probably soybean fields, I'm guessing. And the core area was only 30 acres. Um, so that's the green blobs, 30 acres for, for the month of August. I'm sure that deer bedded probably 20 yards in the side of that tree line and would go out and feed and go back. We have all seen this before. That same deer in November though, same buck, uh, his home range was 1,070 acres in the month of November and his core area where he was 50% of the time was 146 acres. And so he did spend a lot of time on that edge of that soybean field, but he was in the deep timber as well. And so this holds true no matter where you are in the country, uh, over seasons, their home range and core area expand. And you can see that in this graphic. This is data from all the bucks that were collared in, in that study in Maryland. Um, and you can see from the summer, it's always their smallest use of an area going into late summer, early fall, to the pre-rut, to the rut, which would be November in that landscape, to post-rut, to winter, and then it shrinks after that. So that is something you can take to the bank home range and core area get bigger in the fall going into the rut. But what about that lull of activity you've all heard about, right? That deer go into some kind of lull, particularly in the pre-rut. Well, if you look at this, this is a, uh, a bar graph from a study in Louisiana. Um, and you can see that during the pre-rut, their movement over time, so distance over time is meters per 30 minutes. So that's what the, the study was, was looking at. For every 30 minutes, how many meters did these bucks move? And you can see that in the pre-rut, they increased. So that's strike one. Anybody a baseball fan here? Well, what about any other studies? There's that Maryland study I just talked about. All the bucks in the pre-rut were increasing their movement during October. What about another landscape, Texas, increasing during the pre-rut, strike three? That theory is out, ladies and gentlemen. Three studies, three strikes. The October lull does not exist. Um, so many studies have shown us that bucks will start to increase their movement during this time of year. So what's happened? In all likelihood, this perceived lull is a shift of summer to fall food sources, this time of year, although it's green out, no matter where you are, I'm uh, we're starting to see some really good color up where I live, but it's still pretty green, but all the plants are drying out. The amount of lignin is increasing, their digestibility is decreasing, and deer are starting to focus on new things that are showing up that they need to eat to bulk up on carbs and not protein. And so they're responding to that. And they're also probably responding to a pressure of humans in the woods. Um, I have hung stands. I've been out in the woods over the last couple of weeks. I've checked cameras. I changed batteries. I'm sure many people have done this. We weren't doing this in the middle of July um, as, as, as a general rule. And so deer responded to that. And we'll talk about that later today too. So what do you do? You scout for new places. You, you move your cameras. You change what you're doing um, in a nutshell. Not to belabor that, but just don't get stale. Do something different because deer are going to respond to those changing conditions. Well, what about during the rut? Um, you know, I've heard this too, like deer will basically stop moving in the rut, like lock down, right? Um, is that true? Let's look at one buck. This is a study in Pennsylvania. That's buck number nine in the photo on the bottom left. And we're gonna say uh, a week in November at a time. Uh, you know, we'll go one week at a, at a time and see what this buck is doing. Um, green is food plots. This is in the North Central PA. The black line is its home range. The orange lines are its core area. And so in the southern part of the home range, this buck spent a decent amount of time uh, during the first week. You can see there's a couple of valleys there or, or drainages that he was spending a lot of time. Second week, man, he holed up all the way in the eastern side of his home range. He spent most of his time all the way over there to the east. I wonder what was going on over there. Um, third week in November, he was all over those food plots. 
fourth week in November. He was all over that one food plot. And so what we've seen as a general rule is that bucks don't decrease their movement during the rut. They are just concentrating their their effort or where they're spending time within their home range. So their core area is actually moving around with the resources. And so there is no evidence of an October low. There is no evidence in GPS studies of a lockdown phase during the rut. And so you know what they say, Jared, shifts happen. They just keep moving. So you got to keep moving. So what are, what are bucks doing? Core areas versus bucks and does. You can see this is a study from Tennessee where we measured before the rut or before the pre-rut, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, and then after. And does in this study basically maintain, those are the green bars, where they where their core areas were in their, in their home range and how much time they spent in them. Those did not change for does. But for bucks, they decreased. And in fact, they didn't wander widely during the peak rut, but they were only using about 30% of their home range during the peak rut, as buck number nine showed a couple slides ago. He was just really concentrated in a couple places. So this, these studies, Aaron Foley did this uh, project, um, found that all the bucks that were collared, most of them would use only 30% of their home range and would have two or more what he called focal points of 60 to 140 acres in size of activity, where they would actually, during the peak of the rut, they just kept going back to those same places over and over again. They would visit, revisit them frequently, roughly every day. So what are bucks doing here? Well, he also found when he overlaid all the bucks in the study that several individual males overlapped the same focal points or spots, suggesting many bucks were going back to the same places. So I know everybody's wheels are turning here. So we're thinking males are spacing visits to ass assess basically doe receptiveness. Are they ready to breed? They're not, I'll come back in 20 to 28 hours. And he might be the late, late man. He could be the early man back, depending on where that doe is in her estrus cycle. But that's what bucks are doing and why their core areas are shifting around. So buck number nine, a couple of slides ago was doing exactly that. What about habitat? Um, certainly habitat influences where deer are. Um, this is a study in Pennsylvania, um, a single buck, his home range in yellow in spring, uh, in summer in blue, spending a lot of the same time um, in those two months. But you can see the summer home range was the smallest. If you remember the bar graphs that I put up earlier, that's when their home ranges are gonna be the smallest. In the fall, um, this guy's home range was so big, you can only see parts of it on this picture. And then in the winter in green, um, it, it became about the same size it was in the spring, but he was uh, concentrating on a bunch of cool season food plots. Those all had brassicas in it. The uh, the brown circles or, or polygons were oak flats. Uh, so in the fall, he was spending time eating oak, acorns. And in the winter, he was spending time eating those uh, cool season crops that somebody had planted for them. So of course, habitat influences where deer are and their home age and core area. Let's go back to those personalities I talked about earlier. This is a real interesting phenomenon within the deer world and, and movement. We have found in a couple different landscapes that some deer, not only are they more likely to be like Ted Danson and movers and shakers, but some of them actually are borderline migratory and have multiple home ranges. And so that this is from Mississippi State. So we mentioned Bronson Strickland earlier, uh, that he runs that lab, Mississippi uh, Deer Lab with uh, Steve Damaris. And one of their researchers recently, Luke Wiesop, presented this research where uh, they found about a third of the bucks in their study had what he called mobile personalities or these almost migratory behaviors. So the deer on the right had a, uh, two home ranges that were four and a half miles apart. The one on the left was a typical deer that had more of the um, norm personality, you know, sedentary, had a, you know, about a square mile home range. But we've seen this in Texas. That was it. That was in Mississippi. Here it is in Texas. Here's a six and a half year old buck with two home ranges, three and a half miles apart. Here's a deer in Louisiana that had two home ranges. And you can see these movements. Um, March 18th, uh, 2013, this buck was in the home range on the left. 
one day later, he went six and a half miles away. One day, walked six and a half miles and set up shop, stayed there all summer, spring and summer. And on August 7th, took a couple days to basically get back to his old his old home range. He did it exactly the same thing the following year, the same day. He left on March 18th and went to the other home range. And so there's some thought behind this that this might be a deer that dispersed, you know, at a young age, at a yearling age, set up its new home, and for some reason uh, went back because it knew the resources were there during the summer to eat. It's not breeding season. He's going back. He knows there's good food there, but these are just theories. We really don't know. Uh, but there are some deer that have these things. Finally, uh, the last thing I want to talk about for influences on home range and quarry area is like physical barriers. This could be anything like from a power line, a stream, uh, a two, two lane road, a dirt road. Uh, it doesn't need to be something that's impassable like a fence. So this is a buck in this uh, photo on the top left. Um, that's a clear cut outlined in yellow. This is in the state of Georgia. That deer basically lived the month of June inside that clear cut. Uh, July still did, was in the fields a little bit. And just to the north of there is a county road. August, he crossed it once. September, crossed it once. These are like hourly marks. So like one time the deer was found, and that could just be error from the satellite picking up the GPS point. October, never crossed the road. And you can see the points are breaking up in these photos, right? Because their home range is getting bigger. They're spending more time traveling every day. But that deer never crossed that. And I've seen this before with small creeks, really, never crossing little places. Here's a photo uh, of a movement of a deer in uh, Maryland in the study of Chesapeake Farms. Uh, the home range is that kind of cream colored. This is zoomed real in. Uh, that deer left its home range for the first time and crossed a road. That's the blue line movement during the middle of the night and spent uh, daylight hours the next day in this pond. It's like kind of a black horseshoe shape down in the bottom left-hand corner. And when he tried to cross it at dusk the next day, got hit by a car. Um, and so this happens. Physical barriers exist that you and I would not assume would be something. Um, and I just wrote an article for NDA's website earlier this year about how far can a deer swim. And there is a ton of examples of small creeks that deer just stopped moving. And so you can go check out that article on our website. Just type in, do any internet search, how far can deer swim? And I promise you, it'll come up pretty quick in, uh, as an example. All right, let's move away from home range and core area. We, we knocked that one uh, silly for a while. Let's talk about how far deer move. Um, they move pretty good distances, but it's going to vary. Just like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of variance in this. Um, could be a mile or two, could be lots of miles, depending on resources avail available. If they're in the South Texas and it's a homogeneous landscape with nothing but brush country and cactus, and they need to go walk long distances to get food or get to feeders, they'll walk more. Um, if they're in areas that are wide open, they'll walk more. But if they're in a mixed environment that has woodlots and small ag fields, not big ag fields, they don't travel as much. And so what we found over time um, is that this will change. And so this is what Dr. Carl Miller, professor uh, at University of Georgia, has done some of the most interesting and uh, most published deer research that we've ever had put out. Uh, Carl's students did a project where they were looking at how much deer were traveling. And each one of those lines is an individual deer. And now this, this is a study site in way down South Louisiana. Um, this is the non-breeding season, but it is the months of October, November. Their peak rut isn't until like January, February down there. But each one of those lines is an individual deer. And you can see they're pretty consistent, but there is variance there. And uh, he calls this the spaghetti graph because once I go forward, you can see during the pre-rut and the rut, things go all over. It's like throwing spaghetti at the graph. So there's those personalities that I was talking about, right? Each deer is different. Some are going to be real travelers, some aren't. And you can see there is a definite average increase during the pre-rut, like we mentioned before. Even though some individuals are not traveling a lot, as a herd, as a population, they're traveling more during the pre-rut, um, during the rut, 
there's a lot of noise in there, but it's higher than it was during the non-breeding season. And during the post rut, it starts to decline. But the take home message here that I want you to know is that the, the, they are traveling more over time, but the majority of it is still happening at night. And so let me blow up a couple of slides to show you this, but this one on the right hand side is showing night versus day. And you can see the peak of the activity is, is there in December. Um, but night is dark brown and that mustard color is daytime. And so they're traveling about twice as much in the dark than they are during the day. But we do know there are a couple of take home messages, take it to the bank messages I want to have you have you uh, go home with. I told you one already about Buck's uh, home ranges getting smaller when they get older and that the fall is the time of year when they will travel the most. Another take home is that Deer are most active at dawn and dusk. There are some small circumstances where that's not true. They're unique, they're rare. But for the most part, you can see this is the study in Maryland that most deer are most active at dawn and dusk. Dusk That 6, 7 a.m., 6, 7, 8 p.m. mark. And it doesn't matter what time of the year. It is. Um, you know, you can see summer's in orange, uh, early fall's in yellow, they're down at the bottom. Uh, Pre-rut is in green. It's about the same, uh, but the rut is way up there. And so, you know, I've killed deer in the middle of the day, good bucks. And I'm sure some of you are here saying, I'm, you know, I've done it too. Yes, you will see deer on their feet in the middle of the day. But when you compare it to what's happening at dark, look on the left side of the graph and the right side of the graph. If you were to draw a visual average there, it's twice as high as during the day, even during the rut. And we've seen this pattern everywhere. Um, here's a study from Pennsylvania um, where this is the entire month of October and the distance moved, peaked um, again around dawn and dusk. At night, it's about twice as high. They're moving about, uh, well, 60, 65 uh, meters per hour where it's 40 to 45 meters per hour during the middle of the day. Here's a graph from Wisconsin. This isn't even GPS research, folks. This is trail camera detections by hour in something which is a cool citizen science project. This graph shows, um, this is called Snapshot Wisconsin. Uh, this graph shows five over five and a half million photos summarized across the state between January 2017 and December 2021 of deer detections. That's 5.7 million deer detections and most photos are being taken of deer at dawn and dusk. So you can take that to the bank. Deer are most active at dawn and dusk. And so let's bring this all home from the messaging of deer movement and what we know as it relates to how much they move in the day, during the year, seasons, home range, core area. There's no correlation between home range size and their movements. You have some deer that have small home ranges, and very, move very little. And you have some that have small home ranges and move a lot. And these happen at all ages. It happens at two, three, four, five, and older. You have some deer that have giant home ranges and move very little. And you have some that have giant home ranges and they move a lot. And this goes back to the personalities. Now, I don't like to anthropomorphize, I'm messing that word up, but uh, you know, talk about human personalities with people, with deer, but there is a continuum of personalities in deer, is that some are sedentary, some are sedentary and they move a lot, and that may include excursions, which I'll talk about next. Some are going to shift movements and have those dumbbell-shaped or multiple home ranges. Um, some might just bounce around a lot. And so this goes in where you might have pictures of deer or see deer once and never see them again. That might just be the personality of the deer. And I, I give this kind of as a take home message for folks is that if you have a deer that's on its feet a lot during daylight hours, no matter how old it is, um, and you see it a lot on camera and your neighbors don't, that's a deer that you will probably get to see as it gets older. And if it's something you can pass up, you can protect it. Not that we all have to do that, but if you want to grow older deer, those are the ones that you would do that. The ones that you see happenstance that are fly by night show up. Um, or are all over the place and your neighbors are seeing it, it's going to be harder to do that unless you're working with your neighbors. And so just a take-home message on personalities. Let's talk about excursions. 
bucks and does go on excursions. And what excursions are is when you have a mature deer, older than a yearling, older than one, so two, three, or older, and they leave their home range for a period of time where they're supposed to be 95% of the time, and they go far away, and then they come back. We didn't even know these things existed until about 10 years ago with GPS collars. They're found in all age classes, young, middle, and old. They're found in all landscapes all over the country. And originally, we thought they were breeding really, that they always had to do with a buck chasing a doe, that it was going to take the buck out of its home range. But that's not necessarily true. Um, most of this is happening in the rut. Here's a couple studies. You can see the peak in the rut. Uh, where at the, on the left side, 60% of the excursions happened during the rut, 100% of them happened during the rut in Texas. So most of them do happen in the rut, but they happen at other times of the year. Deer can go pretty far. They'll go a few miles, just like a dispersal. This is an example of a buck going three miles in eight hours, three miles away. Just think about where your hunting property is and what three miles away is. So having a picture of a buck over and over and you see them and you see them and then all of a sudden the next day somebody three miles away kills them this is just a one-time thing maybe where a deer left and came came back if they if they didn't get killed um the furthest or longest known documented excursion was this deer in missouri that a lot of people have covered 186 miles it's a three and a half year old buck that started out just north of kansas city on the left and at point A and cross multiple rivers, moved about eight, nine miles uh, per day. Um, during the day, would stay in these little locations in towns, basically little woodlots or little drainages, but covered some serious ground and eventually got hit by a car, I think, um, but died. We've written about it. Outdoor Life has written about it. But this was a three and a half year old. So he wasn't going on a dispersal. This was an excursion. This deer could have been messed up in the head. He may have had a cranial abscess, which is something they'll get an infection in their brain. If bucks fight and they get um, a wound or will fracture their skull a little bit from the fight and get bacteria in there, they can actually, it messes up their brain. If you've ever seen a deer walking in circles, um, that is could be a cranial abscess. I don't know what this deer was doing. This is really unusual for a deer to go almost 200 miles, but it was a three and a half year old and he went a long ways. In yearlings, they do it as well, the one-year-olds. Uh, and this is a study out of Illinois, at uh, SIU. 60% um, of the yearlings made an excursion. So 29 of the 49 bucks they had collared. Of those, um, 10 finally went on dispersals, but 54 excursions were, were made before those 10 dispersals went. Um, compared to dispersals, the excursions had shorter average distance, a greater average speed, and more path complexity. And so the researchers surmised that excursions, at least at that age class, may have been like testing the waters. They were going out and testing to see where they wanted to disperse. I don't know if that's true. Again, we're adding personality to the discussion, but yearlings go on excursions where they go out and they come back. Even does go on. This is a study in Pennsylvania um, in mid-November. This deer went four miles, it's a doe, an adult doe, and came back. Um, five of the eight collar does did it. So bucks and does do it. Um, this, for those of you that are younger, you may want to avert your eyes. This is the first documented booty call in the GPS deer wor world. We got a buck and a doe collared. Uh, the does on the left uh, in blue, the buck is on the right. They both had GPS collars. This was in uh, Tennessee. I think the doe was living in a Home Depot. I'm not really sure where she was living, but uh, six o'clock in the morning, he probably calls her. Um, three hours later, um, oh, that animation didn't work. Let's see. Uh, all right, we'll just go with it. Uh, nine o'clock in the morning, they meet up outside both of their, I don't, who knows, maybe there was a bar there. Uh, noon, they went back for a, uh, I don't know, afternoon delight. Uh, three o'clock, they're hanging out at his place, and by uh, six p.m., uh, he's he's back at his house, and uh, or nine p.m., and she's just hanging out there. But this was a rare case where there were collars on bucks and does, and they documented two excursions where they actually met up. So some kind of rendezvous. Interesting. Uh, and I mentioned at the very beginning that in the fall, 
we thought most of this was happening in the fall, um, but they happened in the spring as well. Um, all 19 of 19 bucks collared in this Pennsylvania study went on an excursion in the spring. Um, here's one in, I don't remember what state this is, but a five mile excursion for four days uh, in February. That was a two-year-old. Here's a three-year-old. This is in Louisiana, I'm pretty sure, uh, over about a day. This is the month of May. Um, you know, 25 hours, went six miles total, about like three miles away. So they they happen. And so my summary for excursions, just like dispersals, they happen. Um, about half of adult bucks will go on an excursion, just like half to 75% of young bucks go on dispersals. About half of bucks will go on them. Slightly more happening in the fall when you look at all the studies of the bucks that do. About half of those do it more than one time. So again, there's those personalities. Some of them just are wanderers. They go about one and a half miles away on average, but they range. They can go pretty far. Um, and they'll be gone about a day, just under a day. If you look at all the studies and you average all of them, but some of them, they, I just showed you one a couple slides ago that was four days long. You know, a, a buck that was older, two or three, left, came back four days later. And there's that explains, again, just like the dumbbell-shaped home ranges, those pictures that you get, those random pictures where a deer shows up and then you never see it again. All right, I've got three more things to talk about. Weather. Uh, okay, we all think weather affects deer movement, right? It's in our soul. We feel it. Um, how many times have you heard you one of your friends, or I'm going to guess many of you have said, uh, this cold front coming through, it's got bucks on their feet. You can Google it. Uh, those are all the things that you see. People talk about it. Well, when you have collars on deer, thousands of data points, thousands of deer, you would expect when a cold front goes through, you would see it right in the data. You don't. <laughs> uh, this is a cold front moving the state of, through the state of Pennsylvania, like hundreds of deer collared before, during, after a, a winter storm, during the fall. Deer did not change what they were doing. Cold fronts did not change what these, they had GPS collars on them, folks, where you, we know where they are to the meter. So what's going on? Well, if you dig into the research, and I did tell you I was going to go with some of the old radio telemetry research, I found conflicting evidence. Um, some studies said that weather events such as barometric pressure, rain, humidity, cloud, wind, all these things uh, are negatively correlated with these things. So weather and deer movement don't jive. And I found some studies that said, yes, they did. What happens when you dive into the actual GPS studies, though, like the one I showed on the slide before? Well, there was that inconsistency there, too. There have been some researchers that have found uh, temperature and wind uh, affects deer movement, but others that found conclusively that they didn't. And so this is one of those head scratchers. As a hunter, I do feel weather impacts deer movement. But the research doesn't say it conclusively. It doesn't. Um, there's definitely conflicting evidence. And so we'll just continue learning about that. These are all GPS studies on this one. And the slide before wasn't was the old radio telemetry stuff. But I can't, in all good faith, saying weather absolutely affects your movement. I can't do it as, as a scientist. But as a hunter, I feel it that they, they must. What about moon? That's a popular topic, right? Never mind cold fronts. Uh, what about moon phase? Well, if moon phase would influence it, we would see that on collars as well. This is a long-term study out of Mississippi State University, the deer lab that I mentioned earlier, where they charted moon phase, or they wrote moon illumination, but the fair thing is to say moon phase, full moon versus new moon, over an entire fall and looked at daily movement of like dozens of bucks that were collared to see how much that moon phase changed what the deer were doing. And as you can see, just like the graphs I showed earlier, there is an increase in movement going into the rut, but there's no clear cut rise or decrease right before a full moon or before a new moon. It's just that if you smooth those lines out, I mean, those are day, day and night that you're seeing going up and down, 
those are not anything other than that. And so we don't see it, at least in their movement. What about breeding, though? You know, breeding must actually show it. This is a nine-year study in New Brunswick, Canada, that actually charted every conception, meaning egg and sperm meat, having a, a deer that's actually bred across time with moon phases. And the peak of breeding fell within the same seven day period every year, no matter the moon phase. You can see that on the graph on the left. This is from 97 to 2005. Some years there was a really distinct moon phase right around breeding, but other times there was not, where you'd have a new moon or a full moon. Uh, it just didn't show it. And so what we do know from moon phase, if I really look at the, the research, I highlighted, you don't need to read all these words, but look at the blue ones. These are actual quotes from the abstracts from a dozen studies. Moon phase had no effect, no relationship, did not affect, no relationship, not statistically significant. They moved in opposite directions, not affected by the moon. Moon phase does not influence deer movement. You may have an app that tells you the moon is impacting what deer are doing. You may have one of those charts or circular things that tells you it's all a lie. Moon phase does not impact deer movement. I may be busting some, bursting some bubbles out there, but these studies do not lie. So why do we believe it? If you ask hunters, does it have an effect? They say, heck yes, it has an effect. Um, will they travel more at night? Yes, they do. Why do we do this? Why do we think this? Well, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And I'm going to take a home here, Jared. The last thing I want to talk about is hunter pressure. Um, we're often our own worst enemy when it comes to myths. And we're our own worst enemy when it comes to deer movement and, and our impact on it. We target certain segments of the population. You may be trying to drop a lot of does like we talked about at the very beginning. I am this year. So I concentrate on trying to shoot a lot of does. They pick up on that. Guess what? They know. Uh, or you may be chasing bucks of a certain age class. Well, younger bucks will pick up on that. You're not shooting them. Um, there's a hunter there in that tree choosing to pass up that buck. And so how we manage our hunting pressure is definitely going to impact what we see for deer walking around. And it's going to definitely impact our harvest. And that can impact your goals as a manager if you're trying to manage a property. And so we can quantify this. Basically, if you compare what you see while you're hunting to what's on trail camera, if those things don't agree, there's probably an impact from you being out there. Your hunting pressure impacts what they're doing. You can experience or, or express this in, a, in a, a lot of different ways. If you wanted to keep track, just figure out how many times you hunt a certain stand and how many deer you saw. And I promise you, over time, you're going to see less deer in those stands unless you space out those visits. And here's where the GPS collar stuff comes in. We know spatially and temporally, fancy way of saying over space or over an area and over time, deer pick up on us and our presence. The image on the left is a graphic, a heat map, if you will. Grant Woods actually created this for uh, a hunt club back in the uh, early 2000s where he had them chart where they were hunting every time. Well, guess what? They were hunting on those food plots almost every time. And the brown is a heat map, if you will, of every stand and how hard it was hunted. And you can see there were some pretty dark brown spots. Guess where the deer went? They went in the white spots where nobody was going. Those might actually not be the best cover, but the deer picked up on it. And so if you can just change that, you can change what you're seeing. If you see in the top left-hand corner, they, they went three times the visibility of deer, went from 0.3 deer per hour to a deer every hour. That's actually very high by just changing what they were doing. And so how often and how hard we press deer uh, will definitely have an impact. Luckily, there have been some uh, research projects that have looked at this. So um, let's look at a couple of those. But first, an anecdote. Um, for those of you in Pennsylvania, you know, I'm in New York. I mentioned that earlier. You know, it's a holiday up here when it's deer season. We all we all march outside, especially our firearm season. Pennsylvania is a different world. Wisconsin, too. And, uh, you know, it's an army of people going out in the woods that weren't there before. And uh, this is a deer. I hope this animation works. And if not, I'll just try to tell a story. And it doesn't look like it's going to. 
I tested it too, but this this is a uh, an animation of a buck that basically 9 p.m. the night before opening day um, is in the woods there. That's his home range. Um, he goes over to the west. You can see a cul-de-sac. It's like a little development. Spends most of the night there. And around 7 a.m., 6.45, 7 a.m., he hightails it because some hunter probably walked out his back door and goes all the way up to the top right corner of the slide where that black right angle is, which is public land to the right, private land to the left. And that deer held up in a 20 acre laurel thicket, mountain laurel thicket for like a week and a half straight. He never left it. That was a five and a half year old buck that had a collar. on, And so that deer lived five years enough to know where to go to get away from hunters and who knows if that guy knows if that guy came out smelling like bacon that morning or what spooked the deer, but he was all over the place until opening morning. Oh, it just started moving, but you got you got the point. All right, so let's talk about two or three studies, and then we'll we'll do a summary slide. Uh, this is a uh, study done in Georgia where they actually split up a property and looked at food plots that were frequently hunted versus rarely hunted on the same property. The orange bars are daylight visibility or, or you know, where the deer was in those plots. The blue bars are nighttime and time goes down as you look at the screen. If you look on the left-hand side as the season progressed, daylight use of the frequently hunted food plots goes down. Whereas literally just a couple hundred yards away, where the same size food plots, same plants were in, the bucks that and does that were using those food plots maintained daylight use where they got rarely hunted. So think back to that graphic I showed a minute ago uh, where Grant Woods made the heat map. The places you don't go, deer continue to stay out in daytime. This is a study from North Carolina where they drew a harvest zone, like a theoretical harvest zone. That's the red line on the left-hand side where if somebody was in that stand or tower blind, Every location within reasonable shooting distance of a firearm where a deer could be standing, where they could actually shoot it. And they created a geofence. And then they had bucks that were collared. And any time a buck was standing in it, they looked at how that changed over time. The graph on the right shows that food plot use maintained the green bar or green line, maintained to go up, meaning they continued to use cumulatively those food plots. But when they were there during daylight in the bottom, you can see the green line is going down, meaning uh, at the beginning of the season, one out of every three visits in those plots were during the day. And at, by the end of the season, couple, like 12 weeks later, it was one out of 20 visits. They were not going to those plots in the day. Same thing I just showed you just in a different way. The interesting thing about this study, though, was they showed how quickly it happens within 12 hours. The odds of a buck entering that harbor zone were reduced by half. So if you walk into it and sit in a stand within 12 hours, deer are recognizing it and they're changing their behavior by 50% of what they were doing before. So in other words, a buck was two times as likely to avoid putting itself as risk at risk if it'd been hunted for within the 12 hours prior. And so what they also found was it took a couple days for deer to go back to normal. And so if you think of a typical hunting weekend where deer are attracted in the graphic on the right-hand side to a certain location, could be a feeder, could be a food plot, could be a, a, a tree that's dropping acorns. You hunt it, they immediately start avoiding it the next day, and they refrain from coming back for at least three days until midweek. And so we had an article on our website years ago about the best day of the week to hunt is a Thursday. Because by then, all the deer are going back to being normal. Um, we've actually seen this in other examples. Final study I'm going to share with everybody. This is a study out of Noble uh, Foundation from Oklahoma, where they not only measured time, how quickly it impacted, but they looked at what density of hunter pressure made the effect. And so they had these, this is like several thousand acres. Um, Andy Little did this study, several thousand acres. And they moved the treatments around. So they did this over several seasons. They had one area that was no risk. No hunter was allowed to go in there. 
one low risk area where they put a hunter for every 250 acres and then one where they had a hunter for every 75 acres. I don't know about you, but where I live in New York, we have more than 100 per 75 acres, I can promise you. And they just looked at that. And then the next year they randomly assigned it again and they moved them around and they collected all this data. And what they found was there was a response to hunting pressure from the no risk where there was no hunters to where hunters walked. They saw movement rates go down, uh, the path complexity, you know, how the path deer took to get from point A to point B instead of a straight line, they got more complex. They were using cover and observation rates, of course, went down. And they did it again within three days. And so the interesting thing in my last slide is that they found this at the higher hunter density, at a hunter for every 75 acres. So there's likely some threshold out there where you can hunt regularly, but as long as you're not filling up the landscape with hunters, deer just don't get impacted. And so what that threshold is, is going to vary based on the landscape. And you got to try to test it yourself. But that's something we learned. So my take home message for all of these slides. And, uh, you know, I'm pushing an hour, but we're doing pretty good. Let's do our take home messages. We know bucks and does have personalities. They are individuals. I like to I like to I'm more of the norm. You may be more of the uh, the Ted Danson, right? Uh, you might be more of a wanderer. So bucks are individuals. You got to learn those deer. Um, there is no silver bullet. I can't give you a silver bullet other than deer are most active at dawn and dusk, which I'm sure you mostly knew. Um, so there's that one. Deer are most active at dawn and dusk. And obviously during the rut, they're going to be moving the most. Uh, the third take home message, home range is going to move shift seasonally and outside influences food and the rut are the biggest influences. So home range is going to change over time and with resources. Four, as bucks get older, something called site fidelity increases, meaning their home range gets smaller. They're more likely to stay where they're safe. Five, excursions happen. They happen all year, different uh, types of deer, bucks, does, different seasons. There's no way to predict when and how far. You just know they happen. We don't know if weather impacts deer movement. It's un uh, unclear. Seven. It is clear, even when the moon's out, deer are not impacted by that. And finally, hunting pressure pressure absolutely impacts deer movement. And so with that, you know, I'll plug again. This is some slides from our Deer Steward course. If you like this, go to the other master classes and watch Craig and Bronson and Kip. And I'm sure you like those too. This is just a taste. We've got 20 something presentations in that course. Sign up for it, take it. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was unbelievably awesome, Matt. And so awesome, in fact, that I, I mean, I, I have dozens of questions that I'm looking at here and I'm having a tough time finding one that went unanswered. So um, I'm going to buy myself some time here and we're going to post the giveaway link in the chat right now. Uh, so it's just been posted a number of times in a row. So go grab that enter. It's only going to be open for the next few hours for the folks in this class. Um, so again, we're going to be giving away a seat to the deer steward class that you just got a small sampling of, uh, again, there's some more small samplings on the Onyx hunt YouTube, but clearly information that you do not want to go without, um, so here's one uh, that, you know, maybe I didn't see it presented, uh, but I'm guessing you have some information on it. How far will mature bucks tend to travel from a giving bedding area during daylight hours? Does that change from, you know, early season to late season? Can, can you speak to any of that movement? You know, again, really honing in on getting into a bedroom close enough that you're going to get a shot opportunity within daylight. Yeah, that's great. So it definitely uh, depends on the time of year. Um, during the summer, when their home range and quarry area are the smallest, they're probably only traveling a couple hundred yards, honestly, um, you know, where they're feeding um, at, at the most. I mean, it may even not even be, be that far because their home, their quarry at that time is like 30, 30 40 acres. But during the, the rot, when we're hunting, um, you know, I'll say at the peak of the year when their home range is the largest, believe it or not, they're not feeding that much. Um, deer just don't eat bucks. Don't, they don't eat that much during the rut. 
uh, they're they're spending all their time concentrating on breeding, and they're on their feet miles, you know, three, four, five miles during the day. Um, I'm kind of walking around the question, but if I were to put a number on it, if I were to say what is the average distance a buck will travel from where it's bedding to its eat where it's feeding, I'd say it's probably somewhere in the 250 to 400 yard range. It's probably, but it's going to depend. Um, totally. You know, if you're in Western South Dakota, it's not going to be the same as if you're in Rhode Island, you know, because it's wide open grassland versus, you know, small urban areas where they probably have food and eat on people's shrubs in their front yard. So it varies. Yep. Uh, a couple anecdotal funny comments there. Uh, a couple people have uh, made it clear they are deleting their moon phase app. So there's that for you. Uh, does here's an interesting one. Do gut piles affect deer and deer movement from any of the research you guys have done? Uh, there has been no study that I'm aware of that has measured that, but I can tell you anecdotally, it does not. Um, there are plenty of cases of deer walking by gut piles that I've experienced or stories my friends or colleagues have told me. Um, and so I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, if you could key in on one or two things that you've learned uh, living in all of these movement studies that have made a difference in your hunting strategies or habits, give us the top one or two. I'll tell you, I'm supposed to do a piece on uh, calling and rattling. We're going to have a calling piece next month, next week, and then a rattling one a little bit. Um, deer don't heal here as well as you would think. And uh, I would say call loudly because deer will travel because of that. Um, that's something that I definitely have changed what I do is just calling from a, from a movement standpoint. Uh, I tend to try to get on deer earlier in the year if I have a pattern on a deer and be more aggressive. I know a lot of people are worried is probably a good a good number one or number two is you're only going to have the best predictability of a deer early enough in the year and they're traveling the least. Whereas all of that chaos, that spaghetti graph that, that we shared, you can't predict any of that stuff. Obviously I like hunting the rut, but if you really want to target a deer early season is better. Awesome. All right. Well, we're posting the giveaway link one last time here. Uh, I think uh, I, I am out of questions that have not already been answered inside of this presentation. So we greatly appreciate all of your time, Matt, and everybody that tuned in tonight. And Matt, if folks want to hear more from you, where can they follow along and get all of this great information uh, dispersed throughout the year? Go to deerassociation.com. Find our website and uh, we get a We put a newsletter out every Thursday that has tons of free stuff in it. At least sign up for that. And we do have a membership at a free level. We have paid memberships, too, that goes along with that newsletter. So just join. It's free and sign up for our newsletter and then awesome. follow us on social media. Awesome. Well, Matt, everybody here learned a ton, bunch of positive comments pouring in. So. Uh, they all and we all greatly appreciate your time and knowledge and uh, best of luck in the whitetail woods everybody as you're getting out be safe wear your safety harnesses and enjoy it absolutely good luck everybody thanks matt see ya